Hello, everybody. It's uh, Jeff Gibby over at Metastock. I want to welcome you to the website or to the room today. We are getting off to a little bit of a, a slow start. We had a little bit of an audio issue, but don't worry. We just worked it out. We're, we're going to start two minutes late. Want to say thanks for coming. Um, you know who I am. I'm Jeff Gibby. Let me let me read you our legal disclaimer, and then we'll turn the time over to Jim today. Today's demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock and the accompanying software plugins. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using specific indicators and features within the software. The information, software, and techniques presented today should only be used by investors who are aware of the risk inherent in trading. Metastock shall have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of the software, any trading strategies, or any information provided in connection with the company. That's the end of it. I'm sure you're happy. I do want to spend a, just a second to introduce Jim. Uh, Jim Crimmins is uh, somebody that we've had in the room before. And to be frank about it, um, um, it's a very, very interesting speaker. I kind of went into the first webinar Jim did kind of thinking it was going to be a boring trade, uh, like accounting type of a thing. But really, uh, my eyes were opened not only into how beneficial it is, uh, what your tax hat data is, but how much these guys can actually help you. And so, with that being said, uh, Jim is a, a very nice guy. I think he'll be interested with what he has to say today. And Jim, why don't you say hello to everybody? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I know you've got a lot of choices on things you could do on a beautiful summer afternoon. But here we are. And uh, Jeff, I've changed. You're not I'm going to I'm, I'm be boring today. <laughs> Okay, well then that's fine. Um, I'm going to let you go for it though. I'm gonna oh. Get out of the way. All right, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And of course we have our own disclaimer, so I'll leave that on the screen for a moment. And our contact information. Traders Accounting is down in the Phoenix area in hot Arizona. Um, we haven't always been here. We started up in the Seattle area, moved down here probably 10, 12 years ago. We've been around since the mid-1990s. We were the first accounting firm to spe uh, specialize in doing taxes and tax strategies for active traders. That is my personal email. If you've got any questions or anything, be sure and email me or call me on the 800 number. Now, I will answer all of your questions at the end of tonight's presentation. So uh, if you've got them, I recommend you go ahead and put them in the uh, question box on your dashboard as you have them <clears throat> so you don't forget them. And then I'll get to them at the end. The whole thing we're going to talk about today is your responsibility as a trader to protect your cash because cash is king. Your number one job is cash flow. Now, of course, you're going to say it's a trading, but it's not because you can trade and lose money. So your number one job is to learn to trade and make money. <clears throat> so everything you can do to maximize your cash flow is going to be important to you. I'm a trader as well as an accountant. I've found over the years it's a heck of a lot easier to trade with more money <clears throat> than it is with less money. So... Honing your trading skills certainly helps your cash flow. But there are also a multitude of other disciplines, including accounting, that you can apply to your trading, which may not quite be equal to being a better trader. In some cases, may be better. Your largest expense as a trader is taxes whether you make money or lose money trading. Now, I know you can understand that as you make money, 
you're going to go up in your the taxable amount, the percentage you're going to pay, your tax brackets. But how can I say if you lose money, your largest expense is trading? Well, let's look at it as an example. Sally Kumquat, first year trader, didn't do too good, lost $13,000. How much of that can she deduct from her taxes? Yeah, $3,000. So she left $10,000 on the table that she couldn't deduct. If she's in the 25% tax bracket, can you just see how she eroded $2,500 from her trading capital? There is a way if you're trading stocks and or options to get around the $3,000 loss rule. And it's legal. But your imp most important job is protecting your cash flow. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, as an active trader, you can trade to trade as one, one of two methods. You can trade as an investor and all of us started out there if you are a trader and you have not set up a business you are an investor or you can trade as a business now it's your choice they're both legal you've got to qualify to be a trading business and we'll go through that in a few minutes but Trading as a business gives you so many more opportunities. An investor has the limits on the deductions they can take. Uh, as an example, the limit on investment interest. If they trade on margin, they can only deduct the margin expense up to the degree that they made money trading. So if they lost money trading, they can't deduct their investment interest. And we all know about the 2% threshold, the limit on your miscellaneous itemized deductions. And of course, the capital loss deduction that I just talked about. We'll get into some other ones as we go that are going to kill an investor. Now, what kind of business should you set up? I don't know. I have no idea. I know there are corporate puppy mills out there that will tell you if you set up an LLC in Las Vegas or Wyoming, you'll never have dandruff athlete's foot and your kids will be the smartest ones on the block. But that there's a technical term for that. It's called BS. It's because they don't want to take the time to work with you to ascertain which type of business is going to be the most tax efficient for you. Now here's a list of the businesses that you could trade in as a active trader. You could be a sole proprietor. You may have heard it called <coughs> trader securities. Nothing to set up at the end of the year you just file a Schedule C along with your tax return and you can deduct your expenses. The disadvantages of sole proprietor, and I, I just hate to tell you this, but they get audited much more frequently than anyone else. And there's no asset protection. Now, I'm not going to talk very much about asset protection today. Just remember that you, in this country anymore, in our litigious society, you can get sued for anything or for nothing. And if you've got your trading account sitting out there in your own name and you get sued, they may very well take it away from you. Whereas if you have it in an entity, it's pretty well protected. The next entity that you might want to trade in is a limited partnership. These are kind of antiquated at this point. When I started trading, this was the entity of choice. LLCs, 
limited liability companies, probably the entity of choice today and makes sense for a lot of people to trade in an LLC. You can deduct your expenses, you've got asset protection, but you've got to remember, please folks, listen, you've got to remember that if you set up an LLC in any state, you've got to have two members. Now that's not the IRS rules, that's Jim's rules. Because with two members you set up a partnership and that's how you're taxed. If you only have one member, the IRS considers it to be a disregarded entity and you flop back to that sole proprietor. And now you're subject to all of those uh, audits and everything else. A C corporation. In a seminar, when I can see people, when I say C corporation, they roll their eyes. But I've got to be honest. There are two or three situations that a C corporation is the most tax efficient entity to trade in. First of all, you got the deduction of expenses. You've got the asset protection. Now we start getting better. A C corporation and only a C corporation has a written document called a medical reimbursement plan if it's set up correctly. And what the medical reimbursement plan does is allow you to pay for all of your medic years and your family's medical expenses and then bill the corporation for them where it becomes a de deductible expense to the corporation and it's not income to you. Now that includes all insurance, including long-term health and your health and, and your health insurance. It includes co-pays. It includes all deductibles. It includes prescriptions and deductibles on prescriptions and ones that are not covered. And even some over-the-counter drugs and paraphernalia that you buy to mend wounds at the drugstore. Now this, for somebody that's got four to $5,000 a year that they're paying out of pocket medical expense, this is huge. Now, a corporation has lower tax rates than individuals. Well, that's huge. And the one that I don't have up there, is that if it's set up properly and you just happen to lose money and then decide to quit trading, you can close it down and the losses become ordinary income losses on your personal tax return. So there's a lot of reasons to use a C-Corporation. Now the disadvantage is how do you get the money out of it? And, and some of you are saying to your mind, uh, double taxation. Well, double taxation normally doesn't apply because it only kicks in when you pay dividends. And sometimes it's easier for some of my uh, higher income taxpayers that I work with. We play what if games to see if it's more tax efficient to take it out as a dividend or as payroll. So, but you can take it out either way. When you pay payroll, it's an expense to the corporation, so it's a write-off. And the last one is an S corporation. Now, I don't recommend S corporations normally. The only reason that I do is that if you are going to set up a 401k sponsored by your S corporation and you're going to fund it, why? Because with an S corporation, your profit has to come out, about 50% of it, as payroll. And when it comes out as payroll, guess what else comes out? Payroll tax, 15.3%. So you don't want to do that normally as a trader. That's not tax efficient. An LLC, if you trade in an LLC, you pay no, no payroll tax. However, if you're going to set up a 401k and fund it, 
you have to have payroll. That's the only way to fund a retirement account in this country. So that's when an S corporation kicks in. Now, all of these are good businesses. Sole proprietor, maybe not so good. The rest of them are. But again, I have no clue which one is best for you or for anyone else without talking to you. We offer a free 30-minute consultation if you're interested to discuss which would be the best one for you, the most tax-efficient one for you. So if you would like to have that free consultation, you can call us here. I had the number up before. I'll put it up again. And we have two different plans. I put this slide in just this time because everybody always asks me, well, Jim, how much does it cost? We've got one plan that costs $295, $295 plus the state filing fee. And we've got this plan here, the Platinum Plan, which includes everything that's there. I most of the time think for most traders, the Platinum Plan is the cheapest because you get the business coaching in which we go through all of the paperwork and make sure it's dated and signed correctly. We have a mark-to-market meeting. We have a uh, performa, five sheets for a performa that we help you fill out so that we can see if you're going to make money or lose money and what changes we need to make if we're going to lose money. We have bookkeeping, six months of bookkeeping, very important for you, and the entity tax return at the end of the year on the platinum plan. Now, that one is $19.95. But again, if that's out of your price range, we've got one for $295. And you do get one consult with that to go through your paperwork. So if you're interested, give us a call. The IRS is normally governed by Congress. And the laws for taxation are normally passed by Congress. However, when it comes to trading, Congress has never said a word. So the IRS did. They took it upon themselves. And the tax courts have verified what they have said. So if you're going into the business of trading, you've got to be an active trader. There's three special rules to qualify as a trader in securities. You must seek to profit from daily market movements. Well, that doesn't tell us much, does it? However, daily market movements, we think that we know that because we've been doing it for 25 years now. Daily market movements include swing traders, scalpers, and day traders. Now, you can also have some long-term holes. You just got to mark them differently. Your activity must be substantial. Well, this is a cop-out on the IRS part because there's a tax court case where a guy traded, traded 328 trades. <clears throat> the IRS said he was not a trader. He took it to tax court and won. So 338 trades. I like to go at it from a different angle because there is some written documentation in the IRS code that surrounds uh, certain business activities. And they say if you have 500 hours working towards your business activity, it is a business. Well, 500 hours is 10 hours a week. You cannot be an active trader unless you spend more time than that. However, if you want to use that, you better have a daytimer on your desk 
and log in all of the time that you're listening to webinars, that you're studying, that you're uh, researching, that you're trading, because it's going to be two to three years if you get audited. And if you do, you need to be able to prove that you spent that time. The IRS doesn't have to prove that you didn't. And the last one is pretty common in all business language. You've got to carry on the activity with continuity and regularity. Uh, that means you've got to trade throughout the year. However, if you start trading in the middle of the year, well, then you only have to trade for the rest of the year. If you set up a business in the middle of the year, you just have to trade throughout the year. Continuity and regularity. The big tax court case on that was Frank Chen versus the commissioner in 2004. Mr. Chen took $80,000 from somewhere, established a trading account, and went broke by March. He didn't do his taxes for about three years, and I can understand that. I think he thought that he'd paid enough taxes from his job because he was an executive with a dot-com company, and that the loss that he had was a loss, so he would need to pay taxes on that. But it, what he forgot was that $3,000 loss rule. He lost $80,000 or thereabouts, well, he could still only take $3,000 off his taxes. So that didn't help his tax situation very well. Well, it there were a lot of things that came out of that case. It's the biggest case we've had. And uh, he lost, of course. So The next two slides are an Excel spreadsheet that I've prepared be more than happy to send it to you if you'd like. It lists the expenses. Whoa. That an active trader might be able to or will be able to deduct. Starting with organizational expenses, that's the cost of setting up an entity. That's deductible. We recommend that you purchase your equipment computers, desks, etc., etc., when you set up your company because, hey, they were yours, let's take them. We're trying to get every dollar we can. We're trying to protect that cash flow and get you as much cash flow as we can. The next one's a big one. If you don't know about it, it's called pre-incorporation expenses. It's called investigatory expenses. Um, what it says is you can go back some time in, in time, and most CPAs agree that 12 months is pretty normal. You can go back 12 months, accumulate all the expenses that you've already spent money on, bring them for, well, you have to have receipts or some proof of purchase. Bring them forward, and now we can write them off. We can deduct them. We can only deduct $5,000 in the first year, and then we amortize the rest. It's huge, folks. I, I am working with a guy right now, $27,000. He says, I didn't realize I spent that much going to classes. Yeah, you do. $27,000. He's going to write off five, and we're going to amortize the rest by the month. <clears throat> payroll. We pay payroll for only two or three reasons. Number one is if you've got kids at home, and they can um, perform a job for your company. And you're paying them an allowance now that is non-deductible, let's put them on the payroll. We can do so so they don't have to pay any taxes up to a certain limit. That's one reason. The other reason is because if you're going to take and form a 401k, a self-directed 401k and or 
an IRA or anything else you need to take payroll, pay payroll tax, and then invest in in the uh, retirement account. Home office deduction. People kind of poo-poo at that. I think probably in the people that I work with, the average that they are able to deduct in a year is about 1500 Well, 1500 if they're just in the 20% tax bracket, can you see the tax giving them $300 extra? Now, $300 may not be much to you, but if a trader is scrambling, that is not chump change. And the big ones at the bottom, if you go to seminars somewhere, if you go to uh, the Traders Expo, the Money Show, any of those, you can deduct all of that. If you, whoa. Okay, it must be the next line. Business startup and organizational costs are generally capital expenditures. Hey, you can read this. Why don't you go ahead and read it? This is right out of the IRS code. Now, what this says, but it's wrong, even though it's in the code, is that you get $5,000 for the cost of creating a corporation or a partnership, plus $5,000 uh, for the pre-incorporation expenses in the first year. Now, if you want a copy of that expense sheet, just email write it down here, learn at tradersaccounting.com, put slides in the subject window and press send. We'll send it out to you. Be more than happy to. So what's the IRS stance on expenses? Deductions are a matter of legislative grace. The taxpayer must maintain, this is the important part of this folks, the taxpayer must maintain adequate records to substantiate the amount of deductions or credits claimed. I see more people get in trouble because they cannot substantiate what they have tried to deduct. And a lot of small businesses throw their receipts away apparently because they estimate what their expenses are going to be and when they get caught there's absolutely nothing they can do so be careful if you're going to trade as a business that you learn how to document all of your expenses it's not hard it just takes a little discipline and this is a set of CDs and uh, a huge workbook that'll teach you how. Tax Strategies for Business Professionals. It's absolutely the best thing I've ever seen. It's taught me a lot. Uh, in here, Sandy Botkin, who's an attorney and an, uh, an accountant, goes through each of the category of expenses that a small business, not just a trader, but a small business person would have, each category. Then he shows you what you can deduct in that and what you cannot. The next step is he shows you how to maximize what you can deduct. And that's what we're trying to do here today is to teach you to maximize your deductions. Once he teaches you to maximize your deductions, then he shows you how to document it to stay out of trouble with the IRS. It's the most fabulous set 
for a small business person or a trader that I have ever seen. Uh, he's taught me a lot. Like I said, he taught me how to go to Hawaii for seven days and write it off. I'm so happy about that. Here's the 15 IRS audit rates. I don't have the 16 yet. I never know where to throw wash sales in for you folks that are trading stocks and options, but it's a very important part of our our quest to increase our cash flow in that it can eradicate our cash flow. So it's important and the IRS looks at it closely. What the rule says, if you own a position could be a stock or could be an option and you sell that for a loss and then buy the same or a similar stock or option back you do not get to take the loss now the rule says if you buy it back within 60 days, that's 30 days before you sold it for a loss and 30 days after you sold it for a loss. Well, this is a big deal if you're not watching it. We had a client several years ago that had a $50,000 swing because of wash sales. Now, what he had done was trade the same four stocks over and over and over again throughout the year, and it created all these wash sales that never went away. Your brokers now, for the most part, are showing you your wash sales. I don't think they're that accurate, particularly at the end of the year when you have to be very careful because at the end of the year, you don't have any time to burn the loss off. So be very careful with wash sales and if you're trading as a business there's a way to get rid of wash sales. And here is the way folks, here is the silver bullet. <clears throat> Mark to market is an accounting method. When we were in school if you took an accounting class you were taught there was cash accounting and accrual accounting, but there are other types of accounting methods. Normally they're specific to industry groups. Mark to market is for uh, traders. It's also for banks, but a different type of mark to market. It has, it, it's an election that has to be taken with the written document to the IRS. It has to be taken no later than April 15th of the first year you want to use it, even if you file an extension. It's still got to be done by April 15th. What, it, what does it do? It converts capital gain and capital loss to ordinary income and ordinary loss. Now that does not change the amount, the percentage of taxes you pay. But what it does do, if you have a loss, it's going to be an ordinary loss now, and you'll be able to deduct as much as you want against your ordinary income. It also does away with wash sales. So how do you get it? You send a letter to the IRS. What type of trader would use it? Now let's go to the next one. What type of trader would not? Normally a trader trading futures or forex would not use mark to market. There are other reasons you would not use mark to market. I highly recommend <clears throat> that if you're thinking of taking mark to market that you have a good frank discussion with either your accountant or give us a call because it's not a panacea for everything. 
If you're going to set up a business, what state should you set it up? Well, I go back to those corporate puppy mills that I talked about before. Many of them will tell you, hey, you got to set it up in Nevada because they don't have this and this and this and this and this. And it all sounds good, and they're not lying to you, but it doesn't mean squat. The reason they're doing this, folks, is called the Kaching Factor. We should make a movie called that, the Kaching Factor. That's because if you set it up in a state you don't live in, you've got to have a resident agent. And they're hoping that you will hire them to be their re your resident agent at $300 or $400 or $500 a year. And you've got to keep it for as long as you have the entity. So you've got they've got residual income coming in. Now it's much better to set up your entity in the state you live in with the exception of three states, which shall go unnamed. A self-directed 401k may be the biggest tool a trader could have. It's not what Fidelity or Schwab or anybody else is selling. They're, they're, they're playing with fire there. This is a true self-directed 401k where you're the custodian. You make the investment decisions, and you're not obligated to just buying product that they sell. You could even invest in Uncle Guido's pizza parlor if you wanted to. You could invest in real estate or anything else. Now it's two-sided. Number one is many traders when they come to me, they tell me that they wish they had more money to trade with. A lot of our money is tied up in retirement accounts. So if they have money in retirement accounts, that would be IRAs or 401ks from previous employers or anything else, why not move it over to a self-directed 401k? Now, <clears throat> you as the custodian can make any investment decision you want. But in addition to that, now listen to this, you can borrow up to $50,000 of it for five years to do anything you want. So if you don't have enough money to trade in, but you've got money socked away in a 401k or an IRA, don't pay the penalties and the taxes to take that money out. Set you up a self-directed 401k. You can talk to us about it. This is the number you would call. Very important. Now, the other side of that, I said it was two-sided, is that in a year you're making a lot of money trading, you're scrambling around looking for tax strategies. <clears throat> the best tax strategy I know is to put fifty to $60,000 in a 401k as an expense so that you can write it off and you've got the money in your account, you're not going to have to pay tax on it until you take it out, and you can do anything you want with the money that's in the 401k as an investment. A self-directed 401k, a huge tool for a lot of traders. As an accountant, I don't want to criticize any accountant. However, Accountants come in many flavors. If you're going to be an active trader and you have a relationship with an accountant, you owe it to that accountant to go to them and ask them a question. Do you do taxes for active traders? Do you feel comfortable? 90% of the accountants in this country will tell you no because they do not have the experience. They probably do taxes for several people that have the trade as investors, but the rules are so different from investor to the business of trading, so different. 
and so many trader or so many accountants seem to try to convince the people that they do know what they're doing and it's not generally the CPAs folks it's generally those people that are in the strip malls and stand out front and flip signs looking like the Statue of Liberty I mean these people normally don't know a damn thing about traders taxation it's tough to stay on top of traders taxation and they train their people a month before they open so if you're gonna be an active trader you need to find a good accountant a good broker and a good mentor they'll all save you money my next webinar will be on September 6th on can you survive an IRS audit one of my best webinars folks you're going to learn a lot about audits it will some of it will scare the devil out of you some of them will make you feel better but anyway I'd love to have you register for that September 6th at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I appreciate your attending. Again, I tell you, if you want to talk about whether you should go into business, that's the first step. Should you go into business? Would you qualify to go into business? The second step is what kind of business. We offer this free 30-minute consultation there's a number right there on the screen write it down it's important you've got to manage your cash flow folks if you're going to be a successful trader there's just no two ways about it okay let's look at the questions you might have and dig them out here okay double webinar with who I don't know double webinar question mark no who I thought you meant you had another speaker after him here our current Congress sucks okay okay somebody put up the Sandy Botkin thing be very careful if you're gonna buy it on Amazon he puts a new one out every year make sure you get the newest one it's updated why won't I name those three states Robin boy you like to type don't you uh, because I don't want to insult the people that live in them is that some kind of state secret again Robin yes yes it is Robin uh, Trey finally somebody besides Robin Trey says we sent an email with slides in the subject line right yes Robin says I'll shut up right now no you can go ahead and talk Robin keep it coming no more no more questions my goodness you such a thorough job no 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 it's not that I put them to sleep they didn't hear what I talked about <laughs> well at least they can email you for the slides do you want to put that up on the screen in case somebody needs to write it down I didn't get a chance to type it um, into the into the chat box so. uh, yeah I can go back and find it okay sure the number is eight hundred nine three eight okay nine five one three there it okay. is right there and then let's send that out and then learn at tradersaccounting.com yeah. yeah. okay see if we got any more quail oh, Robin did stop <laughs> thank you Robin <laughs> thank you I've got to meet you somewhere I don't know whether you're a guy or a gal but uh, with all those questions somewhere we've got to meet both I don't know what she meant by that <laughs>
don't know what he did either. <laughs> Jack, yeah, why don't you give me the capital of the street state so I can visit the Jack Cram? Sacramento, Springfield. I don't know the capital of the third one. But the big town starts with a B. Starts with a B. Has a pretty good baseball team this year. I think they're in first place in the American League East. Does that help you, Jack? In those states, I'm not saying you wouldn't want to set them up in those states, Jack. I'm saying we need to talk about it to see if it made sense for you. Okay? I think I'm through there, Jeff. All right. Well, hey, I want to say thanks for coming. And uh, thanks for doing the event today, Jim. I also want to thank everyone for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, let us know if there's anything that I can do. And make sure you get a copy of the uh, expenses at learn at tradersaccounting.com. Trey says that was great. Uh, Robin says, good job today. Uh, right before he said he's both land and woman. So, in any case, thanks for coming, guys. And we'll see you at the next event. Goodbye.